Very well, Mr. Thompson. To the wheat. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Abs absolutely. Professor Chauncey, let us skip to tab 23, and this is a Los Angeles Times story dated July 10th, 1996. It's entitled, Area Lawmaker Rejects Same-Sex Marriages But Backs Partnership Role. And at the bottom of this first page, and this is, this is DIX 1482, it states, O'Connell, a Democratic who represents Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, as well as parts of Western Ventura County, said he supported granting same-sex couples certain legal rights that heterosexual couples enjoy, such as hospital visitation rights and shared health care benefits, but that he had difficulty supporting gay and lesbian marriages. My impression is that the term marriage is too steeped in socio-religious traditions and mores for people to feel comfortable with its applications to gays and lesbians, O'Connell said in a prepared statement. Neil Demers Gray, director of Unity Pride Coalition of Ventura County, applauded O'Connell's vote. I think it's a very equi equitable position for him to take, she said. Professor, isn't it true that during the mid-1990s, gay rights activists thought it was an equitable position to people to take to support domestic partnerships, even while preserving the traditional definition of marriage? Well, I don't want to generalize about all gay activists on the basis of a single quote. But many took that view. Isn't that right? Well. This is at a time when marriage was beginning to really explode on the national scene with the Hawaii decision in 1993, uh, but still seemed a far distant prospect to many gay activists, given the strength of the opposition to it. I'm not quite sure of the quote, but this would have been issued right around the time of DOMA, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act that had been passed. So I don't know the particulars here, but I could imagine that in this context someone would be happy to get at least this part of what people were looking for, given the scope of opposition to marriage. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1482. Very well, 1482. And Your Honor, at this point, we'd like to put the binder aside, skip the rest of the tabs. So it was time well spent during the break and uh, move to some videos. If we may, we'd like to play DIX 2616. Your Honor, may I have a brief description of that before I have to decide whether to object? Well, it's a, it's a video of an elderly couple who have been beaten up by opponents of Prop 8. I think I know this video from a deposition, and we do object to it. We think that it lacks foundation, and it also is not relevant to the issues that this witness testified to. And, Your Honor... No bearing on his testimony, quite frankly. Your Honor, the reason it's highly relevant is because we intend to show some videos now in which supporters of Proposition 8 were harassed subject to violence. And I want to ask uh, the witness whether one of the reasons that, the, that he has testified that there is still discrimination against gays and lesbians today, and I want to ask him if one of the reasons why there is still that discrimination is because of the types of tactics we saw employed against supporters of Prop 8. Your Honor, if I might, number one, this is hearsay evidence of people who, the video basically, if it's the one I'm aware of, and I think it was introduced in the Sanders deposition, it completely lacks foundation. It also has zero to do with what, what, with what this witness has testified about. And they're gonna put up a claim, things people, where people claim that they were harassed. There's no foundation to even prove that they were harassed. And then he's gonna ask this witness to speculate about whether some people may have voted for Proposition 8 because somebody was harassed and they put out news re reports claiming that. I think we are far afield. I think. <clears throat> Chap doesn't then begin to state where we are at this point. It does seem to me, Mr. Thompson, you can't explore this topic without showing the video. I could. I just thought that it might make it more concrete, but I'm, I'm happy to do it either way, Your Honor. Well, if you can explore it without the video, since there isn't a foundation for the video, that's fine. Okay. I think it's a fair enough line of inquiry. Okay. So you may proceed. Professor Chauncey, are you aware of the fact that there were some churches that were defaced and vandalized during the Proposition 8 campaign? I have no detailed knowledge of these things. I have heard that there were various incidents. And have you heard that there were incidents in which people had their businesses boycotted as a result of donating as little as 
$100 to Proposition 8. I've heard things to that effect said. And have you heard that some people were subjected to physical violence as a result of their support for Proposition 8? I had not heard that. Were you aware that the mayor of Fresno was subject to a death threat that was so severe that the police went out and tried to arrest the person who sent the email? No. Isn't it true that these types of tactics by supporters of the LGBT community had have had the potential to backfire and create resentment against the LGBT community? Well, honestly, I don't know the details here. I don't know by what basis, uh, what basis th there is for claiming that, that these were perpetrated by members of the LGBT community. And I'm really not in a position to assess what effect they may or may not have had here. I'm really... Just so the record is clear, in terms of the level of discrimination against gays and lesbians in the United States today, you don't know the extent to which it's uh, attributable to aggressive, violent acts that supporters of the LGBT community have taken? I think that you would have to make a very elaborate case for me to believe that that is the case. But you haven't studied it. I have not studied that, but it seems unlikely to me on the face of it. But again, that's not something I've studied. Your Honor, at this point, we would like to play PX116, which has been admitted. Well, actually, before we PX. play that, uh, 116, which has been admitted into evidence. But before we get to that, let me ask you, Professor, it's true that the voters of California received information about Prop 8 from a myriad of sources, correct? Yes. From friends, correct? I assume that was the case. From radio, correct? I assume so. From the internet. I assume that was the case. From the newspapers. I assume that was the from case. From their places of worship. I assume that was the case. From TV. Yes. And many people don't form their opinions on important political topics based on TV ads, correct? You know, I'm really best at just describing what I see as the messaging being developed. This seems a little beyond the... And I don't consider myself an expert on, you know, election analysis. Okay, well, I'm asking these questions as a run-up, since he had opined on the TV ads that were run on it. Let me ask you, Professor. <clears throat> Isn't it true you testified you were asked about the purposes and effects of Proposition 8? Isn't it true that some people voted on Prop 8 based on their sincerely held moral values without regard to what was on TV? I imagine that that is the case. And again, one has to understand the history shaping their moral values and the meaning of those moral values. Many people have, as I said yesterday, have opposed desegregation and interracial marriage on the basis of deeply held moral values. And because of the context of hostility and prejudice towards the groups that would have whose lives would have been changed by desegregation and interracial marriage, I think that's probably the case today. Well, it's true that most people, when they vote, try to reflect their moral values, correct? I'm not really in a position to answer that question. Well, you've taught survey classes on 20th century U.S. history, correct? Yes, and I think we would say that a wide range of factors affect people's vote. Uh, a wide range of factors affect people's voting behavior. But it's part of the American political tradition for people to vote on important issues consistent with their religious views, isn't that right? We see that on some issues more than others. And there's nothing wrong with, where that, with that, is there? Uh, they have the right to do what they wish, but we as historians would like to understand what shapes those values and those attitudes. Okay, now I would like to play P I, uh, PX116. Your Honor, again, if we might have a description before we play and head down the path. It's been admitted into evidence and what it is, it's, it's the four and a half minute version of the 30 second ad that was shown yesterday. So it's, it's directly relevant, Your Honor, to his direct testimony. This is the Worthlands. This is the Worthlands, the couple from Massachusetts who described the reason what, what happened in Massachusetts. That that was crea uh, created and turned into a 30 second ad which Professor Chauncey testified yesterday. Has the witness seen this four minute version? Well, I'd like to ask him if he did. Uh, did you happen to see this? Uh, no, though uh, I don't believe that. All I right, have. you may play no. 116. Now, Professor, did you review that as one of the materials you considered in this case? No, though actually now that I have seen it, I realize that I hadn't seen it before. Okay. 
Is it reasonable for parents who morally disapprove of homosexuality to want to wait until the fifth or sixth grade for some sorts of issues to be taught in public schools? Well, would you say that people who morally disapprove of uh, racial equality or racial marriage should be able to insist that no books showing black and white people as equal or black and white people in relationships should be kept out of schools? I mean, I think there is a general sense in the schools that if you wish, you can send your child to a private school, but there are things that will be discussed in a public school and that this is part of the reality in life in Massachusetts now and in the country. Uh, and would you agree that at least the parents have the primary responsibility for raising their own children? And parents certainly have primary responsibility in raising their children, but they also raise them in a society which provides many other mechanisms to teach and educate them. Do you agree that the parent's responsibility for raising their child includes development of the child's moral character? Your Honor, I'm going to object to this line of questioning. Again, it kind of goes beyond the scope of direct. Your Honor, he testified about what these ads were intended, what, what subliminal messages about stereotypes they were played on. So I want to I probe whether that's really true or whether it was going to be a different issue which was parents wanting to uh, inculcate their children on their moral values. How much longer do you have on this? Three more questions, Your Honor. Objection overruled. Thank you. And you would agree that parents have responsibility for developing their child's moral character, including on issues relating to sexual morality. There have been debates for a very long time about what exactly can happen in schools and where parents can withdraw their children. And in general, I think the understanding is that schools are free to and are encouraged to teach broader social values. And in this case, the child is simply being exposed to the existence of gay people. And I take note that the parents don't express concern just about marriage, but about homosexuality at all. Would well, you agree that issues relating to homosexuality and same-sex marriage are issues for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs? I agree that parents can do that, yes. And then you would agree with the proponents of Proposition 8 that parents would have a right to object if their young children were being taught in public school that there is no difference between same-sex marriage and traditional marriage, if that teaching contradicted the parents' own moral values and beliefs, correct? Well, I don't think that they would be able to object to schools teaching about interracial marriage if that conflicted with their moral beliefs. And so they shouldn't be able, in your opinion, to object if the children are being taught about same-sex marriage even if it conflicts with their moral beliefs. That's your view. I think they are welcome to object, but I don't think that that objection would be binding in that case, no. No further questions, Your Honor. Very well, thank you, Mr. Thompson. Redirect, Ms. Stewart. Good afternoon, Professor Chauncey. Not yet. <laughs> it just feels like uh, that long of a day. It feels like afternoon. It just seems like afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Professor Chauncey. Good morning. <clears throat> does Proposition 8 say anything about when sex education takes place? No, it does not. Does it say anything about what parents can teach their children? No, it does not. Does it say anything about what schools or parents discuss with children and when? No. Does it say anything about what parents can object to in terms of the schools? No. We were just looking at the long ad with the Worthlands, and I'm wondering if you have, um, if you think about the reference to gay marriage or homosexuality as, quote, homosexual relationships as an adult issue. Well, again, I think that it implies something wrong with homosexuality. Uh, it, it focuses entirely, it, it suggests the focus on homosexuality entirely as a matter of sexuality, not love, not relationships. This is actually a, a book about two princes falling in love, and it's a fairy tale. It doesn't talk about sex. It's another fairy tale that seems appropriate to that age. Are there fairy tales about men and women falling in love? I believe there are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> is heterosexual marriage viewed as an adult issue in our culture? 
I don't believe that it's something that we keep our children from, no. Do children sometimes even play a role in heterosexual weddings? I believe they have been exposed to heterosexual weddings, yes. Well, have you ever heard of a flower child or a flower girl, ring bearer? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have heard that children have been allowed to be present at and even allowed to play a role in heterosexual marriages. Are there any other themes in the Worthlands ad that you care to comment on, the one that you just saw? Well, again, I think there is the implication here that the very exposure to the idea of homosexuality in gay people somehow threatens the children, threatens their sexual identity, as if that's a, a choice, uh, that this is something, again, that's being imposed on them. Historically, gay rights have often been depicted that way, uh, assuming the very fact that gay people are asking to be recognized and to have their relationships recognized, even by marriage, is seen as an imposition on other people rather than simply an extension of fundamental civil rights for those people. I want to move on to a subject that you testified about a little bit on <clears throat> Cross that Mr. Thompson asked you about, and he asked you a number of questions about your book, and I think your report in this case regarding when Americans and sort of Western society began to understand that homosexual people were a class of people, people with a primary attack, attraction or relationship with someone of the same sex. But I want to ask you to put aside the issue of when people began to understand that concept and ask you whether there is evidence in the historical record, even before those categories were understood, that there were people whose primary erotic and emotional attraction was to people of the same sex. Okay, well this is certainly something that uh, historians are studying today. There's a, there is a broad sense, it's contested as most issues in history are, but a broad sense that the categories of hetero and homosexual emerged and became primary organizing categories of state regulation and personal identity beginning in the late 19th century. But a number of studies have been published, and I actually use some of these in my teaching studies, and, and primarily sources and so forth, that, that do suggest that there were people who had primary erotic and effectual interest in people of the same sex before then. So I will give you just a, a, a couple of examples. One is in Puritan New England. In Connecticut, in the 17th century, a case of Nicholas Sentian, who's one of the most, ex who, who's one of the most extensive court records we have access to. And what's clear there is that although people did not first call him a homosexual, this was not a term available to him. And um, that, that wouldn't fully explain his mode of life, that he had developed a reputation over the course of almost 30 years in his small town in Connecticut as someone who persistently indicated sexual interest in other males and approached them. He actually developed a reputation for this. Now, in this period, people didn't use a term like identity. They talked about character. They had a variety of other frameworks through which to understand someone like Sension. So we wouldn't call him a homosexual in the sense of having a homosexual identity for that period. And yet there is strong evidence that, in fact, he had consistent erotic interest in people of the same sex. Likewise, a lot of attention has been paid to the, and I've written about this as well, the culture of romantic friendship in the 19th century. There were a wider range of bounds and the kinds of relationships that people of the same sex could have, the degree of affection that they could express for one another. What's striking when you got into some of the diaries and, and correspondence that we depend on to reconstruct these relationships are the moments when, say, I'll, I'll just give you an example. It's a diary that I assign in my lecture course in Lesbian and Gay History, written by Frances Willard, who later went on to found the Women's, the women's the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, she is young in the 1860s. So she falls in love with a woman. The other woman falls in love with her, and everyone thinks it's great. It's very conventional. Yet a moment comes when Frances realizes that her attraction is much more powerful and sustaining than her friend Mary's. And there's a sort of crisis for her, so that uh, the boundaries of what is acceptable and the conventions allow them to take the relationship so far. And then, for instance, Willard realizes that this is something different for her, and she doesn't have a ready language for it, certainly not the language of homosexuality and heterosexuality, but she draws on all sorts of uh, framework to try to understand how she is different from other women because of this passion, and she feels for her friend Mary and would go on to feel for others. 
Likewise, in the early 20th, early 20th century, in a period that we discussed at the very end of the day yesterday, um, in direct or uh, cross-examination, rather, talking about my book on the social organization of sexuality and male sexuality in the early 20th century New York. Yes, there was a wider range of sexual possibilities for conventional sexual patterns in the part of some immigrant working class communities in the early 20th century. It was easier in that context for some men to shift back and forth between male and female partners, but their male partners were conventionally typically men who did define themselves on the basis of their difference from other males, on the basis of their consistent desire for sex with those, uh, with other men, and relationships with other men. Again, understood somewhat differently than we would understand it today, the alliance of gender inversion and so forth. But there were people at that time who were, uh, who identified themselves and were identified by others. Perhaps you basis. could throw a question in there somewhere. I was about to do that, Your Honor. Shifting to another topic, Dr. Chauncey. Mr. Thompson asked you a number of questions about various lesbian and gay people who at some points weren't supportive of pursuing the right to marry. And a lot of those questions focused on the period of 60s and 70s. And I want to ask you, during the 60s and 70s, what were some of the priorities of the lesbian and gay civil rights movement? Well, in the 60s and 70s, the fundamental priorities of most gay activists were to simply try to stop the policing of everyday life. Uh, the widespread arrests, the raids on bars, um, uh, restaurants, and, and then to achieve fundamental protections uh, against discrimination at the workplace and in housing and so forth, and simply to be able to come out and be openly known as gay without facing a whole range of forms of harassment and discrimination because of that. <clears throat> and before the mid-70s, were they also working on trying to get the medical establishment to change its view? Yes, that certainly Let was Let the a witness priority. testify, Ms. Stewart. Dr. Chauncey. During the period when African American civil rights were being sought in this country, were there black people who sometimes were not in favor of segregation? Were there black people who were not in favor of segregation? Yes, pushing for segregation. Desegregation, do you mean? I'm sorry, desegregation. Right, yes, yes. Uh, there were debates amongst uh, African American activists about the best way to go, the priorities that the movement should have, fears about pushing the white power structure too far. Mr. Thompson asked you this morning about a statement in your book, Why Marriage, about 92% of companies providing benefits to, well, actually, let me just have you turn in your book to page 52. Uh, sorry, which exhibit is my book? Six, I think, yeah? I think it's six. Um, yeah, right. So there's a reference uh, to, a, it's a survey in 2002, <laughs> a survey of 319 of America's largest companies uh, and that survey of those 319 companies found that 92% of them prohibited workplace discrimination against gays and lesbians. And so your reference earlier to 92% was that to, was to that subset of companies? Yes. 319 large companies? Yes, yes. Is there still employment discrimination in this country today? Oh yes, there is. Uh, on the basis of sexual orientation, yes. Mr. Thompson asked you the question, and I, th I think you responded, whether it's true that the federal government no longer prohibits people from entering the United States. Do you remember that? Yes. Can a heterosexual person marry a non-U.S. citizen and bring their spouse into this country under current law? No, in fact. A heterosexual person. Excuse me, no. Uh, a heterosexual person can bring their married partner from abroad into the country. And is the same thing true for gay people? No, it's not. You mentioned in your testimony in response to a question of Mr. Thompson that some people need to move to California or do move to California to find a more open society. Do you remember that statement? Yes. Why do people need to move to California to find a more open society? Well, they do so because they continue to face hostility and discrimination in the places uh, where they live. A and like other groups which have faced marginalization in the past, people have, uh, often there are enormous migrations of African Americans from the Deep South to the relative freedom of northern cities and western cities over the course of the 20th century. And, and there they found more freedom than they would have found at home, but certainly uh, not complete freedom and rights. 
without drawing a sharp analogy between the two groups, I, I think there's a pattern that we saw in the part of uh, gay men and lesbians who um, have uh, records since the late 19th century, moving away from small towns to larger cities where they could be more likely to find people like themselves, relative freedom, but still, of course, encountered enormous hostility and discrimination. Thank you. Mr. Thompson also asked you about a reference in that same exhibit, your book, Why Marriage, to, and it's on page 51, mm. to a statement that the 1990s marked a major turning point of lesbians and gay men in American society. Do you remember that? Yes. Testimony, yes. Uh, yes. Let's, I believe you said that, uh, tell me again when the book was written. Uh, it was written in 2004. Since it was written, have there been some further laws enacted that reflect discriminations against gay people? Well, the majority of states have embraced legislation or constitutional amendments that would prohibit same-sex couples from marrying. Have there been, how have those measures been enacted? Well, there have been, um, b both by legislative vote, uh, but they also have, a, have been a tremendous number of popular referenda which have been enacted, uh, which have enacted that sort of discrimination. You believe that those measures have an impact on the ability of lesbian and gay people to seek equality through the political process? Yes, I do. And maybe this is a moment to say that, since I, I wasn't able to on cross-examination, um, that I was actually, I, I thought at the time that I published this book in 2004, that there was a greater chance of marriage equality moving forward, and, and that's the way I ended the book. Since, uh, since then, so many states have enacted this constitutional amendment uh, and statute, uh, it's, it's put such an enormous roadblock in the way of, um, of the movement um, on that issue that I'm much less likely, much less inclined to believe that that's the case. I want to now turn to an area where Mr. Thompson focused a little bit on religion and religious beliefs. And I think he asked you some questions about religious organizations or churches that support supported marriage equality. Do you remember that? Yes. I was wondering if you could tell us what some of the major faith groups were, some of the churches that were strong, strongly in support of Proposition 8 against marriage equality. Mm -hmm. uh, the Baptists, the Catholic Church, a range of groups that would constitute a much larger percentage of the population, a uh, much larger percentage of the population than the small, old, mainline, as they call them, Protestant churches. And I believe that when he showed you a video of Pastor Warren, he asked you a question along the lines of, you know, has the religious rhetoric or language being used about homosexuals by religious people of faith become more polite or nicer or something along those lines. Do you remember that? Yes. I'd like to ask you to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 301, which, may I approach, Your Honor? Very well. Okay. This is a document from the website of the Vatican or a... The Catholics for a Common Good, I should say. Uh, it's from a Catholic organization, and it's excerpts from a Vatican document on legal recognition of same-sex unions. I would ask you to read the third paragraph, third paragraph on this page, on the first page. There are absolutely no grounds. Mm, there are absolutely no grounds. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there were are absolutely no grounds for considering homosexual unions to be in any way similar or even remotely analogous to God's plan for marriage and the family. Uh, marriage is holy while homosexual acts go against the natural moral code. Homosexual acts close the sexual acts to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a general effective and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. Would you also read the last sentence of the next paragraph? Is this in evidence? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I would like to move this document into evidence. Your Honor, no objection. Very well, 301 is admitted. Uh, the homosexual inclination is, however, objectively disordered and homosexual practices are sins gravely contrary to chastity. I would like to have you turn to the third page of this document and look at the third full paragraph and read the sentence beginning with allowing children. I'm sorry, which? Um, third, pa third full paragraph, which begins with the absence of sexual complementarity. Oh, okay. You see that? Yeah. Uh, 
the second, the sentence uh, that begins with allowing children. Okay. Uh, allowing children to be adopted by persons living in such unions would actually mean doing violence to these children in a sense that their condition of dependency would be used to place them in an environment that is not conducive to their full human development. Finally, I'd ask you to look at the last paragraph on the page. About the middle of the paragraph, there's a sentence that starts, the legal recognition of homosexual unions. Would you read that sentence into the record? Um, the third sentence of the last paragraph, legal recognition. I'm sorry, are we still on the same page? Uh, we're on the third page of the document, Okay. last right. page of the document. Uh, what is the first word in that paragraph? The church teaches. Third sentence. Uh, legal recognition. Right, okay. Legal recognition of homosexual unions or placing them on the same level as marriage would mean not only the approval of deviant behavior with the consequences of making it a model in present in, in present day society, but it would also obscure basic values which belong to the common inheritance of humanity. Are those statements more moderate framing of religious views on homosexuality in your view? Well, compared to uh, some statements, they are more moderate, but I think they express the fundamental view, obviously, of the inferiority of homosexuals and the dangers that they pose to children. I'd like to ask you to look now at Plaintiff's Exhibit 168, which I'm going to move into evidence. Okay. May I approach, Your Honor? Very well. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Dr. Chauncey, this is a document, a resolution from the Southern Baptist Convention website on the topic of same-sex marriage, and I'd ask you to look at the second page of the document, about the fourth paragraph up from the bottom. Okay. Would you read that into the record? Whereas legalizing, that one? Yes. Whereas legalizing same-sex marriage would convey a societal approval of a homosexual lifestyle, which the Bible calls sinful and dangerous, both to the individuals involved and to society at large, quotes Romans and Corinthians and Leviticus. Uh, now, therefore, be it. Um, and there's a number of resolutions. I'd, I'd like to ask you to look at the next page and read the second paragraph. Uh, resolve that we oppose all efforts by media and entertainment outlets in public schools to mainstream homosexual unions in the eyes of our children. Would you also read the last paragraph? Resolve that we call on Southern Baptists not only to stand against same-sex unions, but to demonstrate our love for those practicing homosexuality by sharing with them the forgiving and transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, quoting Corinthians. I have one more of these exhibits. Um, I'd like to ask you to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 170. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. We have no objection, Your Honor. Very well, 170 will be admitted. This also is a resolution that is on the Southern Baptist Convention website reflecting its policies. Would you look at, let's see, one, two, three, four, for the sixth paragraph down on the first page that begins, whereas any action giving homosexual unions, you see that? Yes. And uh, read that into the record. Whereas any action given homosexual unions, the legal status of marriage denies it the fundamental immorality of homosexual behavior, citing Leviticus 18.22, Romans 1, Romans 26.27, 1, Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And if you look four paragraphs down from that, Resolve that we encourage, would you read that into the record and the one following? Resolve that we encourage all Christian pastors in California and in every other state to speak strongly, prophetically, and redemptively concerning the sinful nature of homosexuality and the urgent need to protect biblical marriage in accordance with God's word. And be it further resolved that we call on all Southern Baptists and believers from all denominations everywhere to pray for the people of California as they seek to right this terrible wrong that has been forced upon them by the California Supreme Court's overturning of the vote of the people, and to pray for the people of every state where biblical marriage is under attack. Dr. Chauncey, are these pronouncements by the Catholic Church and Baptist Convention consistent with your understanding of the religious beliefs, or at least some of them, that were voiced in, su in support of Proposition 8? Yes. 
Professor Chauncey, I believe Mr. Thompson asked you a number of questions about people who may believe that homosexuality is sinful or have other religious beliefs that led them to support Proposition 8. Do you recall that? Yes. I'd like to assume for a minute that these religious beliefs are sincerely held. Would you nevertheless say that they could be affected by stereotypes of gay people that emerged from the 20th century or even earlier and still endure? Yes. You also described segregation theology yesterday, and I think you talked about it again today. And during the battles over segregation and interracial marriage, did people hold sincere religious beliefs that were rooted in prejudice? Yes, that, that certainly was a point of that testimony yesterday. Um, the people do often hold deeply, sincerely religious convictions, which seem to them timeless, but historians have shown and have seen how they in fact change over time and naturally are shaped by the larger culture in which they live. And so again, people may, many people in the South deeply believe that interracial marriage was against God's will. I don't question their sincerity. I believe though that that reflects the larger system of prejudices that had shaped their understanding of the world. Thank you. Professor Chauncey, has there been significant progress toward reducing discrimination against gays and lesbians over the last several decades? There has been significant progress, yes. Is there still today significant discrimination against gays and lesbians? Yes, there is significant discrimination. Now I have uh, my last line of questions this morning may have to do with, or my last before I consult my counsel anyway, and my, um, my colleagues, with questions Mr. Thomas, with M Mr. Thompson asked, or when he asked about whether the tone of political discourse has improved regarding gay rights issues. And I'd like to show you a video relating to this topic and ask you some questions about it. Uh, and we, uh, Your Honor, we had submitted to the court and opposing counsel a list of excerpts and a list of excerpts from from these uh, des depositions that we intended to use in this trial. And these are the deposition excerpts from the defendant intervener, or at least heretofore um, to the defendant intervener and proponent, official proponent, uh, official proponent Hak Shing William Tang, Tam. I'd like to ask that, the, that those excerpts be shown, stopping where there's been a document that we can ask the witness about. Your Honor, we would object to Professor Chauncey being asked about this on multiple grounds. One of them is that it's not something he considered in his expert report, and uh, it's not a material considered. We weren't given an opportunity to cross-examine, to depose him on this, and it's plainly outside the scope of Rule 26. Your Honor, may I respond to that? Of course. He opened the door to it. He asked the question on cross, whether the dialogue about this issue has changed to be less hostile and whether people are much more polite and less hateful in their commentary. And the witness testified about that. And this goes directly to that topic. I think Mr. Thompson did open the door. The question is whether this particular document is one appropriate to use with this witness. It's, uh, this. I gather is the document that the Court of Appeals attached to its amended opinion. I and believe one of the documents is, Your Honor. It's a series of documents by one of the official proponents of Proposition 8 that were sent out to people he tried to persuade to support Proposition 8, including that document, to answer Your Honor's question. I would only add, Your Honor, that this gentleman had nothing to do with the campaign. Even though he was an official proponent, the evidence will show quite clearly that he had nothing to do with the campaign. So this is... I didn't even open the door to what specific individuals may or may not have thought. We have no problem with him testifying to the subject generally just to these documents, which he has never seen before, my knowledge. Your Honor. Ms. Stewart. As Mr. Thompson suggested earlier in a question to the witness, there was broad messaging in this campaign from a lot of sources, and I can't remember if it's Dr. Tam, I think it, I think it is, did a great deal of messaging via the web or on various websites about Prop 8. He was an official proponent. proponent. And so I, I disagree completely with the idea that he had nothing to do with the campaign. He had a tremendous amount to do with the campaign. Are you representing that these exhibits that you're referring to were produced by the intervener defendants? I am not, Your Honor. They were not produced. And in fact, we had no, 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 no. Were they put out as part of the campaign? I think they were put out by Dr. Tam as part of the campaign. I, I see. 
And in connection with that, was he one of the official proponents of Proposition Absolutely, 8? Absolutely, Your Honor. And he was speaking about the campaign to a broad constituency of Chinese voters. Your Honor, the official campaign committee was protectmarriage.com. And these materials were not in any way associated with or paid for by or, or did anyone at protectmarriage.com have any cognizance of these documents. And depending on what they're going to show, many of them uh, predated by years Prop 8. Well, but Dr. Tam was an official proponent of Proposition 8, was he not? He was, Your Honor. I think one of the problems with allowing this line of questioning is we don't even know the date of these documents. Depending on what they are showing, some of them are based on translations from Chinese. I think that they have said that they are going to call Dr. Tam on Friday. I believe the court will be able to hear from him and we'll have a complete record and it will be put in context. Again, we have no objection to the line of questions, just the use of the documents. Your Honor, at the deposition, Dr. Tam testified about the documents, authenticated the documents. Just want to point, I just want to point out, not only is he an official proponent and will the deposition indicate what the documents are in the context in which they're used, but if we can look at messaging or beliefs articulated by Carrie Jean Prejean, <clears throat> I would think certainly the witness could be asked to comment on messages put out by one of the official proponents of the campaign. Well, let's see where the questioning goes with these documents. I may cut you off at some point if it goes too far afield, but let's, let's, let's just see how the testimony goes. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, if you would show the first excerpt. If I could now ask the witness to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 513, which is the document Dr. Tam has just been asked about, had, had just been asked about. And if you would, um, would you just read Why don't you first? just go right to the question? Okay. Ask him to read it to himself and then just go right to the question. Okay. Let me play the video a little bit longer. Now, looking at the beginning of this document, Dr. Chauncey, can you tell me if you think this messaging by Dr. Tam, this letter that he wrote, reflects sort of a lower hostility level than past communications about gay people or homosexuality? No. This is consistent in its tone with a much longer history of anti-gay rhetoric. It, it describes the right to marry as the legalization of prostitution. Uh, it says that it's put forth by the San Francisco city government, which is under the rule of homosexuals. <laughs> He talks about then pushing the gay agenda and says that after legalizing same-sex marriage, they want to legalize prostitution and that the next item on their agenda is legalizing having sex with children. So this reproduces many of the major themes of the anti-gay rights campaigns of previous decades and a longer history of anti-gay demonization. I'd like to offer this document into evidence, Your Honor. Mr. Thompson. We have no objection to the court taking judicial notice of it, Your Honor. May I read two sentences from his deposition to give context since we have seen a long portion of it? You may, but with respect to the document, it does appear that during the deposition, the witness, the deposition witness, who was a party to this lawsuit, indicated that he had written the document and therefore it does appear to be appropriate to be admitted. Yes. Your Honor, and as I say, we have no objection to that. I did want to make clear that Mr. Tam said in, in his uh, deposition at page 19, lines 19 through 22, he was asked how many times during 2008, from January to November, he had had a conversation with Mr. Schubert. He says one or two times, very rare. The impression that's being created that this was part of the campaign is not true. We have no problem with discussions about an individual, private citizen who is now attempting to withdraw to avoid precisely this sort of focus on his individual views. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. You may proceed, Ms. Stewart. Can we go on to the next excer excerpt? I'd like to direct the witness's attention to Exhibit 516. Are you moving 516 in? <clears throat> um, I'd like to ask you to look at the second paragraph of this document. Uh, yes. Yes, Your Honor. You're moving 516 in. Yes. Based on the deposition testimony of Mr. Tam, right? Very well. No <laughs> objection. You see that uh, paragraph is talking about legaliza uh, legislation passed by a local school board in Alameda County on gay, lesbian, bisexual education. Yes. 
you see that it says that um, education such as this used to brainwash children so that one day they will vote for same-sex marriage. Yes. Can you comment at all on that messaging in terms of whether it reflects a kind of less hostile messaging towards gay people? Well, I think that talking about brainwashing children is not a moderate phrasing. It certainly reflects sort of a continuing concern about homosexuals putting themselves forward, often having an this agenda. This appears to have been posted after the election. And, Your Honor, that's one of the problems we have with this whole line of questions with this witness, is that there is not a tight temporal connection. You're going to see some of the documents in this binder are from 2005. Others are translations from Chinese that haven't been certified. So we continue to object to this entire line of inquiry. Your Honor, I think to my knowledge, and I apologize, I wasn't aware that one was in here, but most of these documents we can represent to the court. We were on the Dr. Tam's website at the uh, time of the Prop 8 battle. And also, in any event, this the document we just saw goes to the history of discrimination and the kind of messaging that is still out there more broadly even since Proposition 8. Well, let's focus on what was the messaging at or before the election, at the time of the election or before. <coughs> and if you represent that Exhibit 516 was, in fact, posted in this form or substantially the same form prior to the election, then I think that's a sufficient connection. But let's, let's move on, Ms. Stewart. Yes, Your Honor. Can you proceed? <clears throat> Your Honor, thinly after the election, because it starts by talking about a six to one win on Prop 8. I did, I think, indicate, Your Honor, that this, is, that this one is post-election. There's no question about that. All right, all right, let's just move it along. I'm sure we'll get this into these documents when Mr. Tam comes. <clears throat> he testifies. Technical glitch, Your Honor. What? A technical delay. Dr. Chauncey, if you would, I'm particularly interested in the commentary by Dr. Tam about children growing up to think they could marry John or Jane and what you thought about that messaging in terms of what it was reflecting. Well, again, it's consistent with the ads that uh, – major ads that put out by the Prop 8 campaign in which the little girl or boy comes forward and says that they have read a book in school about a prince marrying a prince. So that makes them think that they could too. So there is a deep fear about the idea that simple exposure to homosexuality or to same-sex marriage will lead children to become gay. And I think that the phrasing here actually makes it clear that the issue is not just marriage equality itself but it's in sympathy to homosexuality. It's about the, uh, they could be subjected to an education on homosexuality in public schools. It's not just being introduced to the idea of gay marriage, but being introduced to the idea that there are gay people in the world, which is taken to be, they oppose, they clearly see this as a, an inferior, despicable way of life. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, I would like to move Exhibit 515 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Is that 516 or 515? Uh, this one is 515, Your Honor. Very well. And I'd also, just before I turn to the witness, I'd like to move in the last Exhibit 514, which I think I forgot to do. 514. No objection, Your Honor. All right, 514 is in and 515. Dr. Chauncey, um, I'm interested in you speaking about the messaging and how it relates to prior messaging and sort of <clears throat> the relative level of an um, antipathy towards gay people that this kind of messaging expresses. Well, I think that it's pretty consistent with the messaging in earlier campaigns. Certainly, again, the persistent theme that homosexuality is a choice, that children who are exposed to homosexuals, to gay marriage, but really to homosexuals in any form, are likely to become homosexuals. So a deep fear about the instability of children's sexuality. The association of homosexuality with disease, the claim that AIDS, associating AIDS exclusively with homosexuality, without thinking about the widespread heterosexual transmission of AIDS in Africa and in the United States. And I think that you sort of have a pretty clear sense here of one of the themes that ran through all the referenda campaigns beginning in 1977 
with Anita Bryant's campaign that to pass an anti-discrimination measure or a measure that in some way granted equality to and recognition of gay people would legitimize them and that we should oppose this. This rhetoric as claimed, just because <clears throat> we don't in any sense want to legitimize homosexuality and gay life as a legitimate equal part of our society, and that marriage is one of those powerful symbols of that for them. So it's, it's premised on a notion of equality and strong hostility toward homosexuality. Your Honor, we would object to that document. It says March, April 2006 on it, plainly before the Proposition 8 was, had even been qualified for the ballot. In addition, Which document are we talking about? It's Exhibit 543, Your Honor. 543? Yes, it says, Your Honor, right under TFC News, March, April 2006. So we object to that relevance ground, and on the relevance ground that these are the views of one individual and not protectmarriage.com. Your Honor, this document, first of all, it's earlier in the testimony, Dr. Tam indicated that the traditional family coalition, of which he is the head, supported Proposition 8 and advocated for it, and that's at page 50 to 52 of the deposition in the excerpts that we have already seen. And secondly, uh, this was on their website, along with a lot of other materials at that time, they were on that website advocating in favor of Proposition 8. And so we think it's relevant, and it, goes, it also goes to the overall messaging that led up to the campaign. I'm going to sustain the objection based on, based on what we've heard to date. We may re revisit this when Dr. Tam testifies, if the facts are as you represent them with respect to the posting of this document, but for the moment, I think that... Mr. Thompson has appropriately objected, and the objection will be sustained. All right, can we, can we wrap up with this witness? Your Honor, I'm going to ask that this be paused so I can make an objection. Very well. <sighs> Number one, these documents have no dates on them, so we don't know whether they are relevant or not. And as we have seen from some other portions of this binder, they are temporarily all over the place. And after the election, years before the election. In addition, many of these are in Chinese and have translations. And although it is true that they were shown to Dr. Tam, we have seen from these snippets his diction as festooned with errors. English is not his first language, and the fact that they showed a translation to someone who doesn't speak very good English and said, is this correct, doesn't prove anything. It's not a certified copy of the translation. Well, I wouldn't characterize Dr. Tam's English in that manner. I'm persnickety, Your Honor. It does seem to me, Ms. Stewart, that, that we have exhausted this topic and would ask you if you would please conclude your redirect examination. 